paradigm shift. An educational comedy. It's not a cause. Not a movement. It's not a social group you can slap a label on to. It's, it's an, an idea. idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. It's a genuine expression. A certain life. Critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, we egos are bound to be bruised. With our silly, strange, politically incorrect. Your style of going about things. Real, Real and raw honesty. Which invites you to be to the, the fullest. fullest. Those who do not attempt to appear more than they are, but are simply themselves, stand out as remarkable and are the only ones who truly make a difference in this world. Whatever they do becomes empowered because it is in alignment with the purpose of the whole. Their influence, however, goes far beyond what they do, far beyond their function. Their mere presence, simple, natural, unassuming, has a transformational effect on whoever they come into contact with. When you don't play roles, it means there's no self, ego, in what you do. There's no secondary agenda, protection, or strengthening of yourself. As a result, your actions have far greater power. You are totally focused on the situation. You become one with it. You don't try to be anybody in particular. You are most powerful, most effective when you are completely yourself. But don't try to be yourself. That's another role. Just be yourself is good advice, but it can also be misleading. The mind will come in and say, let's see, how can I be myself? Then the mind will develop some kind of strategy, how to be myself another role. How can I be myself is in fact the wrong question. It implies you have to do something to be yourself. But how does it apply here because you are yourself already? Just stop adding unnecessary baggage to who you already are. But I don't know who I am. I don't know what it means to be myself. If you can be absolutely comfortable with not knowing who you are, then what's left is who you are. The being behind the human a field of pure potentiality rather than something that is already defined. Give up defining yourself, to yourself or to others. You won't die, you will come to life. And don't be concerned with how others define you. When they define you, they are limiting themselves, so it's their problem. Whenever you interact with people, don't be there primarily as a function or role, but as a field of conscious presence. Why does the ego play roles? Because of one unexamined assumption, one fundamental error, one unconscious thought. That thought is, I am not enough. Other unconscious thoughts follow. I need to play a role in order to get what I need to be fully myself. I need to get more so that I can be more. In essence, you are neither inferior nor superior to anyone. True self-esteem and true humility arise out of that realization. In the eyes of the ego, Self-esteem and humility are contradictory. In truth, they are one and the same. In a wider sense of the word, the ego itself is pathological, no matter what form it takes. When we look at the ancient Greek root of the word pathological, we discover just how appropriate that term is when applied to the ego. Although the word is normally used to describe a condition of disease, it is derived from pathos, which means suffering. The person in the grip of ego, however, does not recognize suffering as suffering, but will look upon it as the only appropriate response in any given situation. The ego in its blindness is incapable of seeing the suffering it inflicts on itself and on others. Unhappiness is an ego-created mental-emotional disease that has reached epidemic proportions. It is the inner equivalent of the environmental pollution of our planet. Negative states such as anger, anxiety, hatred, resentment, discontent, envy, jealousy, and so on, are not recognized as negative, but as totally justified, and are further misperceived, not as self-created, but as caused by someone else or some external factor. I am holding you responsible for my pain. 
This is what by implication the ego is saying. The ego cannot distinguish between a situation and its interpretation of and reaction to that situation. You might say, what a dreadful day, without realizing that the cold, the wind and the rain, or whatever condition you react to, are not dreadful. They are as they are. What is dreadful is your reaction, your inner resistance to it, and the emotion that is created by that resistance. What is more, suffering or negativity is often misperceived by the ego as pleasure, because up to a point the ego strengthens itself through it. For example, anger or resentment strengthen the ego enormously by increasing the sense of separateness, emphasizing the otherness of others, and creating a seemingly unassailable fortress-like mental position of brightness. If you were able to observe the physiological changes that take place inside your body when possessed by such negative states, how they adversely affect the functioning of the heart, the digestive and immune systems and countless other bodily functions, it would become abundantly clear that such states are indeed pathological, are forms of suffering and not pleasure. Whenever you are in a negative state, there is something in you that wants the negativity, that perceives it as pleasurable or that believes it will get you what you want. Otherwise, who would want to hang on to negativity, make themselves and others miserable and create disease in the body? So whenever there is negativity in you, if you can be aware at that moment that there is something in you that takes pleasure in it or believes it has a useful purpose, you are becoming aware of the ego directly. The moment this happens, your identity has shifted from ego to awareness. This means the ego is shrinking and awareness is growing. If in the midst of negativity you are able to realize at this moment I am creating suffering for myself. It will be enough to raise you above the limitations of conditioned egoic states and reactions. It will open up infinite possibilities which come to you when there is awareness. Other vastly more intelligent ways of dealing with any situation. You will be free to let go of your unhappiness the moment you recognize it as unintelligent. Negativity is not intelligent. It is always of the ego. The ego may be clever, but it is not intelligent. Cleverness pursues its own little aims. Intelligence sees the larger whole in which all things are connected. Cleverness is motivated by self-interest and it is extremely short-sighted. Most politicians and business people are clever. Very few are intelligent. Whatever is attained through cleverness is short-lived and always turns out to be eventually self-defeating. Cleverness divides. Intelligence includes. The ego creates separation and separation creates suffering. The ego is therefore clearly pathological. Apart from the obvious ones, such as anger, hatred and so on, there are other more subtle forms of negativity that are so common they are usually not recognized as such. For example, impatience, irritation, nervousness and being fed up. They constitute the background unhappiness that is many people's predominant inner state. You need to be extremely alert and absolutely present to be able to detect them. Whenever you do, it is a moment of awakening, of disidentification from the mind. Here is one of the most common negative states that is easily overlooked precisely because it is so common, so normal. You may be familiar with it. Do you often experience a feeling of discontent that could best be described as a kind of background resentment? It may be either specific or non-specific. Many people spend a large part of their lives in that state. They are so identified with it that they cannot stand back and see it. Underlying that feeling are certain unconsciously held beliefs, that is to say, thoughts. You think these thoughts in the same way that you dream your dreams when you are asleep. In other words, you don't know you are thinking those thoughts, just as the dreamer doesn't know he's dreaming. Here are some of the most common unconscious thoughts that feed the feeling of discontent or background resentment. I have stripped away the content from those thoughts so that the bare structure remains. They become more clearly visible that way. Whenever there is unhappiness in the background of your life, or even in the foreground, you can see which of these thoughts applies and fill in your own content according to your personal situation. There is something that needs to happen in my life before I can be at peace, happy, fulfilled, and so on. And I resent that it hasn't happened yet. Maybe my resentment will finally make it happen. Something happened in the past that should not have happened and I resent that. If that hadn't happened, I would be at peace now. Something is happening now that should not be happening and it is preventing me from being at peace now. Often the unconscious beliefs are directed towards a person and so happening becomes doing. You should do this or that so that I can be at peace. And I resent that you haven't done it yet. Maybe my resentment will make you do it. 
Something you or I did, said or failed to do in the past is preventing me from being at peace now. What you are doing or failing to do now is preventing me from being at peace. All of the above are assumptions, unexamined thoughts that are confused with reality. They are stories the ego creates to convince you that you cannot be at peace now or cannot be fully yourself now. Being at peace and being who you are, that is being yourself, are one. The ego says, maybe at some point in the future I can be at peace, if this, that or the other happens, or I obtain this or become that. Or it says, I can never be at peace because of something that happened in the past. Listen to people's stories and they could all be entitled, why I cannot be at peace now. The ego doesn't know that your only opportunity for being at peace is now. Or maybe it does know, and it is afraid that you may find this out. Peace, after all, is the end of the ego. How to be at peace now? By making peace with the present moment. The present moment is the field on which the game of life happens. It cannot happen anywhere else. Once you've made peace with the present moment, see what happens, what you can do or choose to do, or rather, what life does through you. There are three words that convey the secret of the art of living, the secret of all success and happiness. One with life. Being one with life is being one with now. The ego loves its resentment of reality. What is reality? Whatever is, which is no more than the suchness of this moment. Opposition towards that suchness is one of the main features of the ego. It creates the negativity that the ego thrives on, the unhappiness that it loves. In this way, you make yourself and others suffer and don't even know that you're doing it, don't know that you're creating hell on earth. To create suffering without recognizing it, this is the essence of unconscious living. This is being totally in the grip of the ego. The extent of the ego's inability to recognize itself and see what it is doing is staggering and unbelievable. It will do exactly what it condemns others for and not see it. When it is pointed out, it will use angry denial, clever arguments and self-justifications to distort the facts. People do it, corporations do it, governments do it. When all else fails, the ego will resort to shouting or even to physical violence. Send in the Marines. We can now understand the deep wisdom in Jesus' words on the cross. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. To end the misery that has afflicted the human condition for thousands of years, you have to start with yourself and take responsibility for your inner state at any given moment. That means now. Ask yourself, is there negativity in me at this moment? Then become alert, attentive to your thoughts as well as your emotions. Watch out for the low-level unhappiness in whatever form that I mentioned earlier such as discontent, nervousness, being fed up, and so on. Watch out for thoughts that appear to justify or explain this unhappiness, but in reality cause it. The moment you become aware of a negative state within yourself, it does not mean you have failed. It means you have succeeded. Until that awareness happens, there is identification with inner states, and such identification is ego. With awareness comes disidentification from thoughts, emotions, and reactions. This is not to be confused with denial. The thoughts, emotions or reactions are recognized and in the moment of recognizing, disidentification happens automatically. Your sense of self, of who you are, then undergoes a shift. Before you were the thoughts, emotions and reactions. Now you are the awareness, the conscious presence that witnesses those states. One day I will be free of the ego. Who is talking? The ego. To become free of the ego is not really a big job, but a very small one. All you need to do is be aware of your thoughts and emotions, as they happen. This is not really a doing, but an alert seeing. In that sense, it is true that there is nothing you can do to become free of the ego. When that shift happens, which is the shift from thinking to awareness, an intelligence far greater than the ego's cleverness begins to operate in your life. Emotions and even thoughts become depersonalized through awareness. Their impersonal nature is recognized. There is no longer a self in them. They are just human emotions, human thoughts. Your entire personal history, which is ultimately no more than a story, a bundle of thoughts and emotions, becomes of secondary importance and no longer occupies the forefront of your consciousness. It no longer forms the basis for your sense of identity. You are the light of presence the awareness that is prior to and deeper than any thoughts and emotions. 
pathological forms of ego. As we have seen, the ego is in its essential nature pathological, if we use the word in its wider sense to denote dysfunction and suffering. Many mental disorders consist of the same egoic traits that operate in a normal person, except that they have become so pronounced that their pathological nature is now obvious to anyone, except the sufferer. For example, many normal people tell certain kinds of lies from time to time in order to appear more important, more special, and to enhance their image in the mind of others. Some people, however, driven by the ego's feeling of insufficiency and its need to have or be more, lie habitually and compulsively. Most of what they tell you about themselves, their story, is a complete fantasy, a fictitious edifice the ego has designed for itself to feel bigger, more special. Their grandiose and inflated self-image can sometimes fool others, but usually not for long. It is then quickly recognized by most people as a complete fiction. The mental illness that is called paranoid schizophrenia, or paranoia for short, is essentially an exaggerated form of ego. It usually consists of a fictitious story the mind has invented to make sense of a persistent underlying feeling of fear. The story often has an inner consistency and logic, so that it sometimes fools others into believing it too. Sometimes organizations or entire nations have paranoid belief systems at their very basis. The ego's fear and distrust of other people its tendency to emphasize the otherness of others by focusing on their perceived faults and make those faults into their identity is taken a little further and makes others into inhuman monsters. The ego needs others, but its dilemma is that deep down it hates and fears them. Jean-Paul Sartre's statement, Hell is other people, is the voice of the ego. The person suffering from paranoia experiences that hell most acutely but everyone in whom the egoic patterns still operate will feel it to some degree. The stronger the ego in you, the more likely it is that in your perception other people are the main source of problems in your life. It is also more than likely that you will make life difficult for others. But of course, you won't be able to see that. It is always others who seem to be doing it to you. The mental illness we call paranoia also manifests another symptom that is an element of every ego, although in paranoia it takes on a more extreme form. His sense of being a victim makes him feel very special. The collective ego of tribes, nations and religious organizations also frequently contains a strong element of paranoia. Us against the evil others. It is the cause of much human suffering. The more unconscious individuals, groups or nations are, the more likely it is that egoic pathology will assume the form of physical violence. Violence is a primitive but still very widespread way in which the ego attempts to assert itself, to prove itself right and another wrong. With very unconscious people, arguments can easily lead to physical violence. What is an argument? Two or more people express their opinions, and those opinions differ. Each person is so identified with the thoughts that make up their opinion, that those thoughts harden into mental positions which are invested with a sense of self. In other words, identity and thought merge. Once this has happened, when I defend my opinions, thoughts, I feel and act as if I were defending my very self. Unconsciously, I feel and act as if I were fighting for survival, and so my emotions will reflect this unconscious belief. They become turbulent. I'm upset, angry, defensive or aggressive. I need to win at all costs lest I become annihilated. That's the illusion. The ego doesn't know that mind and mental positions have nothing to do with who you are, because the ego is the unobserved mind itself. In Zen, they say, don't seek the truth, just cease to cherish opinions. What does that mean? Let go of identification with your mind. Who you are beyond the mind then emerges by itself.